Hi, my name is Cole, and today I'd like to talk about the importance of contrast when communicating with data. My youngest son, Dorian, is obsessed with cars. He has a ton of Hot Wheels and Matchbox cars and can stand and drive them around for hours at a time. Uh, he recently turned two and received a set of books called Can You See It? There's one about dinosaurs or uh, the one about vehicles is his favorite. This is actually, we're looking at a page from this book. And the pages all look similar to this where they'll show a ton of different types of vehicles and cars. And they'll ask questions like, do you see a truck for fires? And Dorian will get out his index finger and he'll start tracing it across the page or sometimes his brother will join in and they'll race. And when he finds what he's looking for, he says, I see it. And this is actually quite a bit of work. Uh, it also requires him to have a good sense of what he's looking for. If we take a fire truck, for example, he has to know things like it's probably red, it's going to be bigger than the other vehicles around it, it might have a ladder, uh, this is a ton of work, just one of the reasons it's fun for him. But it struck me as we were going through this process the other day that this is pretty much the opposite of what we want to happen when we're communicating with data to an audience, right? We, they, they won't likely have a preconceived notion of what they're looking for, and we don't want them to have to feel like they're doing work to find what they're looking for. By the way, have you found the fire truck yet? How about now? Or check out how easy it is with this view. That illustrates the importance of contrast, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit further today. Uh, so first, just really briefly, uh, further emphasizing why contrast is important, and then I'll spend most of our time today looking at four different examples and using these examples, examples to illustrate how we can achieve visual contrast, uh, employing three specific strategies, position, color, and added marks. So let's jump right in and talk a little bit more about why visual contrast is important. It's easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons. This is an analogy that Colin Ware uses in his book, Information Visualization Perception for Design. The analogy is, it's easy to spot a hawk in a sky full of pigeons, but as the variety of birds increases, that hawk becomes harder and harder to pick out. In other words, the more we make different, the lesser degree to which any one of those things stand out. Or to say this in another way, if there's one thing that's really important, let's leverage contrast. Make that the one thing that stands out clearly as being distinct from the rest. This helps direct our eyes, uh, which can ease the processing of visual information. There is something bad that can happen when there is insufficient contrast, lack of contrast. Uh, these are some thumbnails of different examples. I realize these are small. Uh, don't worry about the specifics here. We'll actually look at each of these examples in further detail over the course of our time together here today. But notice as your eyes scan across these different graphs, they're pulled in a lot of different directions. And in some cases we have maybe some cues of uh, where we should look first uh, through contrast, but in, in some cases those are actually pulling us to the wrong places. Uh, so when we don't provide sufficient contrast, it doesn't give our audience any guidance on where they should look. Uh, so we wanna to try to avoid that when there is a story that we're telling with our data. So let's talk more about how we can achieve this visual contrast when we're communicating with data. First, let's talk for a moment about how people see. This is a very simplified picture of that process. Uh, this is actually my son Dorian over on the right. Uh, light reflects off a stimulus. This gets captured by our eyes. We don't fully see with our eyes. Rather, they act sort of like cameras, take pictures of the world around us, pass those pictures onto our brain. And it's what happens in our brain that we think of as visual perception. Now, in the brain, there are a few types of memory that are important to understand as we are communicating visually. We're going to focus on one of those today, which is iconic memory. 
iconic memory is super short term. It's shorter than short term memory and information stays there for fractions of a second before it gets forwarded onto our short term memory. The really cool thing about iconic memory is that it's tuned to pick up these pre-attentive attributes. Pre-attentive attributes are huge tools in our visual design tool belt. So we're going to talk more about those now. Uh, before we get there, let's do a quick exercise where I'm going to ask you to count some fire trucks. So I'm gonna, in a moment, I'll put a bunch of vehicles up and count how many fire trucks you see and notice your process as you're doing so. Go ahead and count the fire trucks. So there are four fire trucks here. This takes a bit of work though. Uh, it's similar to the process my son Dorian goes through in his books where maybe you take your index finger out, you're tracing it across these four lines of vehicles, identifying a fire truck, trying to look for other fire trucks, keeping a mental tally of how many you've seen in your head as you scan through the rest. This is a lot of work, but we can change how you process this information by changing how we show it. And the tools that allow us to do that are these pre-attentive attributes that I mentioned a moment ago. And I won't read through all of these, but notice as you scan across the different groups how the one element that's different just catches your eye. You don't really have to think about looking for it. Now we're going to focus on three of these in particular today. Spatial position, hue or color, and added marks. So let's look back now to the fire truck example and show what we can do when it comes to position, color, and added marks to change how you process this information. So first is position. I've positioned all of the fire trucks at the beginning. Uh, makes it a much faster process to be able to just count the four that are there. Check out when we leverage color. Uh, so now I've changed the positioning back to what they were originally. We can leverage color as a pre-attentive attribute in a couple of different ways. In this view, I've made everything shades of gray except the fire trucks and used color sparingly there. Uh, another thing we can do with color is change the intensity of it. So in this view, I pushed everything to the background, made it less intense or put some transparency over it. And the fire trucks are what are rendered in a vivid eye-catching red. Something else we can use to draw attention are added marks. So in this case, I used a check mark to notate where the fire trucks are. Notice though that this adds a bit of noise, right? Could be overkill in some situations or maybe more of an emphasis uh, than we may want depending on the situation. Uh, and we can also layer these pre-attentive attributes. So here's what it looks like if I do color together with my check marks or I could do position and color. Notice how quick that is to really quickly see there are four fire trucks. You don't have to scan through every single line to see there are no more fire trucks. You can sort of glance at it and know that there are four and that you're counting them. Or we could do position, color, and added marks. Uh, again, I think this is probably a little overkill, um, but for illustrative purposes. Uh, another added mark, by the way, would be we could draw circles around the fire trucks or do something else to uh, call attention to them. And again, these are just visual cues that tell our audience, hey, this is important. It's so important that I've you know, positioned it to make it easy. I've colored it to draw importance. I've added these additional marks to make it clear that this is where you're meant to look. So let's talk next about how we can leverage these things that we've talked about, position, color, and added marks, when it comes to the data we want to visualize and communicate to our audience. So for each of these, I'll talk through the scenario and we'll look at some different views uh, and strategies for leveraging the pre-attentive attributes that we've talked about, all in an effort to create contrast uh, and make it really clear to our audience where they should look. First one, we're looking at weighted performance index. So imagine you are a, or you work for a US retailer and you've recently surveyed your customers along a number of dimensions. These are shown along the bottom, selection, convenience, service, relationship, and price. 
uh, we're plotting the weighted performance index. You don't need to worry about how this is calculated, but just understand that it's a summary measure uh, made from the various survey items that fall into each of the categories. We have the weighted performance index for our business, which is denoted by the blue diamond, as well as a number of our competitors denoted by the other colored shapes. Now, I use this example often uh, because I think it's a particularly uh, good one for pointing out how easy it is to create a graph without really thinking about what do we want our audience to do, how do we want them to process, and how do we make it easy? Uh, so this is not easy in its current state. There's a lot going on. There's a lot competing for our attention. There's a lot of processing that we have to do to figure out what we're looking at, figure out where to look, and then try to make some comparisons that might be interesting or um, noteworthy. We don't want our audience to have to work that hard. Because uh, if we do, we run the risk of them either losing their patience um, because they know it's going to take a long time to sort of unpack this graph, uh, or we also run the risk of them focusing on the wrong thing because we've not given them visual cues of where they're meant to focus. Uh, so let's look at a couple different views here. Uh, first, I could think about actually just using contrast in this current view. Push everything to the background except our business and use perhaps just color there as I've done here. Notice that does make it easier to quickly focus in on how our business is doing in each of these dimensions. Um, but we can also change this view, which will allow us to leverage some of the other means of contrast that we've talked about as well. So bear with me because we're going to uh, take uh, perhaps a step backwards before we move forward. Uh, but here I've oriented this as a horizontal bar chart. So the categories that were previously horizontally along the x-axis are now running vertically down the side. Price, convenience, relationship, service, and selection. For each of those, I've plotted the weighted performance index in a rightward direction. Now, there's so much color happening here that we have no real good cue of where to look. So let's start by stripping color out entirely. And now we may not care which competitor is which, but certainly we care which place our business is. So let's highlight that. Then we think about how we can use positioning as a visual cue. So without other uh, cues, our audience will typically start at the top left of our graph or our screen or page and then do zigzagging Z's across as they take in the information. It means they hit the top left first. So we want to think about if there's something important, perhaps we'd want to position that at the very top of each block so our audience hits it first. I can think about also leveraging color, right? So I've put our business in blue, also tied that to the legend on the left, putting the words there in that same blue. Uh, when we talk about using added marks, uh, check marks here would uh, be one way, um, but that's adding clutter without really adding information. So another way to add marks would be to add a summary metric that might be of interest. So now this acts both as a visual cue to say, hey, this is the most important part. Look here. You know, it's so important. I actually put a label there uh, and also provide some information so I can see how my business ranks out of the various competitors uh, at a glance. Don't have to sort of count where it is um, compared to the others. Now, with this view, I can easily make two comparisons. I can scan across the blue bars and get a relative sense of how our business is doing across these different dimensions. I can also focus on one of these given categories, uh, service, for example, and see very quickly how our business is doing on that dimension relative to the competition. This is a much more thoughtful use of contrast. Right? We've leveraged all of the things that we talked about before. Position, color, added marks. Check out how much easier it is to know where to look in this made-over version compared to the original.
Let's take a look at another example. This is one from the Pew Research Center. Just reading along the top there. More Americans get news online. 50% of the public now cites the internet as a main source for national and international news. Still below television, but far above newspaper and radio. Then we have our graph. Uh, Pew Research Center are one of those where they have a very consistent graphical uh, graph template that they use. Uh, it's always the, or nearly always the same colors. Uh, so the first series I bring in will be a certain color. The next data series will be another color, color and so on. Uh, the issue with that is it doesn't always mean that attention is going to be drawn where we want our audience to look. Now here, in this case, we do see the internet trend, which from our tagline at the top is the main focus of this data or this graph is in the darkest color. So that's a good thing. Um, but there's not really huge contrast setting it apart from the rest. And we also have a lot of data labels that just make this feel a bit cluttered. So let's look at a progression with this graph. So here I've taken that same data and just plotted it in my graphing application, Excel in this case. And I thought I'd take you through this one uh, from start to finish, just so you can see my thought process as I make the various changes. And I'll talk you through those. And some of those are going to um, include the contrast that we thought about when it comes to positioning, color, and added marks. So first I want to get rid of some stuff that doesn't have to be there, the graph border and the grid lines. And notice, especially getting rid of those grid lines just allows there to be more contrast between my data and the white space behind it. Uh, next, I'm going to clean up my axes. So I'm going to push them to the background, uh, label them, title them. Uh, also going to line up the dates with the tick marks along the X axis there. It gets us here. Uh, now, one personal pet peeve of mine are these really bold, center-aligned graph titles. So in this case, main source for news is big and bold and in the middle of the screen there. Uh, we talked about these zigzagging Zs that people do when they're processing information a little earlier. But because of that, it means they'll typically hit the top left of our graph first. So I like to think of... Uh, upper leftmost aligning titles, whether it's a graph title or an axis title, just means that our audience hits what they're looking at before they get to the actual data. So I'll move that over. Uh, there's a bit of work we're asking our audience to do going back and forth between the legend and the data. So our legend is right next to the data. It's a little confusing because the order of the data series appear in a slightly different order than the data to the left. So we can get rid of that confusion altogether and just label our data directly. Now, if I were leaving it in this color scheme, I would wanna make those titles the same color as the data as well. Just another visual cue to my audience that makes it clear that those are related. Uh, but I want to use my color more strategically than this. Rather than use it as a categorical differentiator, which is how it's being done here, and I don't need because we have positioning space uh, to differentiate the different trends, I want to take color out and rather think about where do I want my audience to look. The story we're telling here is about internet, so let's use color just there. Now, we don't have a lot of flexibility when it comes to positioning with uh, this data because it's graphed according to what the numbers are, so we can't really move that around. But notice currently the internet trend falls behind where it crosses the radio line down at the bottom left. So this is minor, but I am gonna pull that internet series forward so that the other lines don't cross in front of it since it's the most important one. Uh, when we talk about color, I also want to think about tying the color I use in my graph to some of the takeaways and titling up above. So now if I were to scan through and just look at, look at the colored parts, I'd see the title. More Americans get news online. I see internet jumps out in the subtitle there, and then I can focus on the internet series. So I have some really clear cues about what the story is and what's important. Uh, we talked earlier also about added marks as a way of drawing attention. Here I'm going to use them just on the final points of data across all of the different series, which allows me to very easily make the comparison between where internet is and the others. 
Uh, whenever you're showing data like this, there's some debate that can happen between determining whether to preserve the axis, uh, right here the y-axis, the percent citing new source, or label individual data points, or some combination of the two, as I've done here. And what you want to think about when making that determination is the level of specificity your audience needs to have with the actual numerical values. So if the specific values aren't super important and you'd rather your audience focus on the shape of the data, then preserve the axis and don't label directly. If, on the other hand, the individual values are really important or if there are some that are really important, you want to label those directly. In this case, I've chosen just to label that endpoint, uh, focusing folks on the most recent point of data. But I also left the axis there in case people want to uh, see what the relative values of other points historically were. So you get sort of the benefit of both in this case. And now that I'm here, I'll just do a once over and say, is there anything else I want to do to this to make it better? Uh, I'm going to add a footnote. Also, to me, just from an aspect ratio, this feels sort of spread out horizontally. So I'm just going to tighten it up a little bit. And that gets me here. Let's check out the before and after in this case. So notice we don't necessarily have less stuff there or less information, uh, but it is clearer where our audience is meant to look. So get another example. So here we're back uh, working at the US retailer that we looked at in our first example. And in this case, we are looking at the distribution of our customers across a number of segments compared to the US population. I want you to look at this for a moment and figure out where you're supposed to look. We have some cues here saying, hey, this is important, look here. Somebody drew a red box on the right hand side and labeled the sum of the segments in the, right, uh, the, the red box as 50%. The problem is there are so many other things competing for our attention, colors and lines and dashes, that it can take us a while to even see that that's where we're meant to look. And we may focus somewhere else entirely first. So let's check out how we can change this view. Here I've done nothing except for use my color differently and provided these added marks of 30% on the left and 50% on the right. Notice when you do everything in shades of gray, except where you want your audience to look, how big of a draw that is. So we've used color and added marks here. Let's talk about positioning. So the segments here are, are vague. Uh, let's assume for a moment these segments are age groups, uh, 0 to 10, 11 to 20, 21 to 30, and so on and so forth. If that is the case, then we'd want to keep these segments in numerical order. So if we start shuffling those categories around, it can become really confusing really quickly. However, if the categories or segments uh, along the left-hand side there aren't uh, related in this way, then we can shuffle them around. And if that's the case, then we could use position as well to indicate importance. So we could align these, uh, the segments of interest at the bottom, because then we can not only see the summary metrics of the 30% and the 50%, but also use the relative heights of those bars to be able to compare visually those values as well. Or as we mentioned, if there isn't an order that we have to leverage here, knowing that how our audience processes information starting at the top, we could orient them at the top, which is one benefit you get of the 100% stacked bar, is they're also being a baseline at the top of the graph, allowing a visual comparison of the 30% and 50% coming downwards from the top. So this is an easy way to make it much clearer to our audience where they need to look, right? There's still probably a lot of explaining that needs to go along uh, to maybe figure out this graph, um, but our audience knows immediately where they're meant to focus their attention, which can then ease the processing of the rest of the information.
All right, let's look at one final example here. Uh, so we're back to the Pew Research Center. You perhaps recognize their color palette. Uh, it's the same one as what we looked at earlier. In this case, we're looking at new marriage rate by education. And what's being plotted is the number of newly married adults per thousand marriage eligible adults. We have that data from 2008 through 2012. And we have it broken up by different amounts of schooling. So at the left, we have everybody. And then uh, from the least amount to most amount of schooling, so less than high school, high school graduate, some college, and bachelor's degree or more. I didn't include it here, but the article that surrounded this was really focusing on what was happening in the bachelor's degree or more, that uh, right-hand category. So notice here, we're not making uh, the comparisons very easy. I can see what's happening over time for a given level of schooling, but it's sort of hard to compare those back to the other amounts of schooling. Uh, you know, when we think about what we've been talking about uh, in terms of contrast and leveraging position and color and added marks, I could do that in this view. Uh, I could also change the view altogether, right? So here I've leveraged color in the same view. If I wanted to leverage position, I might flip the categories around, putting the bachelor's degree at the left and then um, working downward and school to the right. But I actually want to change how I look at this data altogether. So if we go back, actually, this is 25 individual bars, uh, which feels like a ton of data. We're looking at data over time, so lines are often a good op option when that's the case. And here I've taken what was previously 25 discrete bars and turned them into just four lines. I got rid of the all uh, data here and just graphed the different categories of schooling. Draw an emphasis to bachelor's degree or more through use of color there only. Uh, positioning, it happens to fall uh, at the top of our graph because of the values of the data. In this case, I didn't retain our y-axis. Instead, I labeled just the beginning points and end points. Note, this makes it easy to compare for a given uh, segment, so bachelor's degree or more, I can compare where they were in 2008 at 62 to where they are in the most recent data point in 2012 at 57, or I can compare what the differences were at that beginning point of data in 2008 across the different segments, or do that same thing in 2012 on the right. So again, it's using these things that we've talked about uh, in allowing there to be contrast to focus our audience's attention through position and color and added marks that just makes the data easier for my audience to know where to look, uh, which sets them off in the right place, helps it ultimately be easier for them to interact with the data. So when we don't have clear contrast, we don't give our audience any clue where to look. And when we do that, we run the risk of them deciding it's going to take too much work, moving on to the next thing, or maybe focusing in on the wrong thing, or uh, you know, taking us down a rat hole because they're focused on one data point or really wanted them to focus on another. You don't want to let that happen. When there is a story you want to tell with your data, use strategic contrast through the things that we talked about here, position, color, added marks, make it clear to your audience to know where to look, which will ultimately set you up for success when it comes to getting your message across. So that's what I have to take you through today. We talked briefly about why contrast is important and then talked about some strategies for achieving visual contrast, specifically through use of position, color, and added marks. Now this is just one brief lesson uh, in storytelling with data. For more, check out my blog at storytellingwithdata.com. Uh, in particular, I'll point you to a couple places. Uh, there's a whole book that I've written about this. Uh, you can read more about it on my website uh, or it's available on Amazon, Storytelling with Data. Uh, I also conduct public workshops where individuals can register and we spend a whole day going through foundational lessons 
for telling stories with data and do a lot of hands-on practice. Uh, so you leave the day feeling like uh, you've got some really great tools to be able to employ going forward and strategies to be able to use when you're communicating with data. And those happen at various cities, uh, mainly in the US and every once in a while uh, on other sides of the ocean as well. So check out my site for more info there. And with that, I say a very big thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to seeing you next time.